Let's discuss chemistry paper one prediction exam. On to question one. List the differences between a conductor and an electrolyte. Okay. Now first things first. Let me give examples of conductors. So conductors are all metals: zinc, copper, magnesium, etc. And we also have one non-metal that is also a conductor, and that is graphite. Now the reason why these are conductors is because they have delocalized electrons. So these are electrons that are capable of moving within the structure and therefore conducting an electric current. Now conductors are in solid state. Okay. On to electrolytes. So electrolytes are substances that can either be in molten state or aqueous state. For example, molten lead to bromide, aqueous sodium chloride solution as such. Now these are also capable of conducting an electric current because they have mobile ions. These are ions that can also move within and therefore transmitting the electric current. Now, the last difference between these two is that when it comes to conductors, when they do conduct an electric current, they remain unchanged. They are the way they were before. But when it comes to electrolytes, they conduct an electric current and they get chemically decomposed by it. So this simply means that they break down. For example, in the case of molten lead to bromide, you end up having lead metal and bromine being deposited. So those are the three differences between the two. On to question two. Describe how you can prepare ethane starting with calcium carbide and water. Now ethane can be prepared from the reaction of water on calcium carbide. What do you need to do? Place a small amount of calcium carbide into a dry flask. Number two, add water dropwise using a dropping funnel. And lastly, collect ethane using the overwater method. And that is that. Moving on to the next question, define the following terms. Covalent bond. So this is a bond that is formed when the shared pair of electrons are contributed by each of the atoms forming the bond. Coordinate bond. This is a type of covalent bond in which the shared pair of electrons forming the bond is contributed by only one of the atoms forming the bond. Okay, okay. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to discuss Roman 3 and uh, delve deeper into what covalent and coordinate bonds are. So in Roman 3, we are told to draw a dot and cross diagram of ammonium chloride. But what we're going to do first is we're going to discuss the structure of the ammonia molecule, move on to the structure of the ammonium ion, and then lastly, ammonium chloride. Are we good? Now let us start with ammonia. Now when it comes to ammonia, this consists of one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. Now let's start with nitrogen. Nitrogen has the electron configuration of 2, 5. So that means it has five valence electrons and it needs three more electrons in order to become stable you know in order to have an octet configuration of two eight right now it's at two five so it needs three more electrons hydrogen on the other hand has only one valence electron and it needs one more in order to become stable remember for the first energy level this can take a maximum of two electrons hydrogen has only one so it needs one more but it can only manage to share one of its electrons, whereas nitrogen requires three more. So you're going to have a case whereby nitrogen atom is going to form three covalent bonds with three different hydrogen atoms by sharing one electron with each hydrogen atom. So nitrogen shares one, hydrogen shares another. Those are two that are going to be shared in between them. Moving on to the second hydrogen atom, same thing. Third hydrogen atom, same thing. And you end up having three covalent bonds. So covalent bonds, you're going to have the shared pair of electrons forming the bond being contributed by every atom, you know, by each of the two atoms. Nitrogen contributes one, hydrogen contributes another, and you have a pair of electrons that are being shared between the two. This is covalent bond. And that leads to the formation of a stable molecule of ammonia. Now, if you look at the structure of ammonia, you're going to note one thing. Nitrogen is going to have one lone pair of electrons. 
lone pair of electrons simply means that it has two unbonded electrons. These are two electrons that are not involved in bonding. They go to a bocando, you know, yeah, they're just chilling. Now, when ammonia reacts with a substance that contains hydrogen ions, hydrogen ions are going to be attracted towards the lone pair of electrons. Let's pause there. What is a hydrogen ion? A hydrogen ion is formed when a hydrogen atom loses its single electron. So hydrogen has the atomic number of one. That means that it only has one proton and therefore it has one electron. If hydrogen loses this electron, it forms an ion, a positively charged ion that contains nothing, no electron, only protons and neutrons. So in this case, this ion has one proton and that is the reason why it's written as such. And that is also the reason why in some cases you're going to hear of it being referred to as a hydrogen proton because it literally has no electrons. Now this is going to be attracted towards the pair of electrons. Now when it comes, what happens? Nitrogen has these two electrons, unbonded electrons just lying there. They're not doing anything. So it can manage to share these two with the hydrogen ion such that you end up having a case whereby the hydrogen ion is now stable because it has two electrons. There's no change that happens to the nitrogen atom because it hasn't gained any other electron apart from what it had already from the covalent bond. So this type of bond is referred to as a coordinate or dative bond. So it's a type of covalent bond because it involves sharing of electrons only that the shared pair of electrons is contributed by one of the atoms forming the bond. So in this case, it's only contributed by nitrogen, not hydrogen. So essentially, hydrogen did not bring anything to the table but itself. So this is the ammonium ion. Now, if ammonium ion reacts with a chloride ion, you end up having an ionic bond whereby you have two particles of different charges. The ammonium ion is positively charged. The chloride ion is negatively charged. And that is the diagram representing bonding in ammonium chloride. Moving on to the next question, state two functions of a school laboratory. Number one, carrying out practicals and two, storage of chemicals. Question number five, identify substances with the following properties. Roman number one, it is an ionic compound, an electrolyte, and can also be used as a food additive. Okay, so when it comes to ionic compounds, there are so many of them, by the way. Okay, electrolytes, yes, all ionic compounds are also electrolytes. So it's the last one that actually narrows it down for us. An ionic compound that is used as a food additive, that is sodium chloride. Roman number two, relights a glowing split has a slight smell, slightly less dense than air and fairly soluble in cold water. Now, don't be hasty to write down oxygen because this is not oxygen. Even though oxygen has the property of relighting a glowing split, this is actually the test that we conduct to find out whether oxygen is present or not. The last three properties are not those of oxygen. Oxygen is odorless. It's denser than air and lastly, it's only slightly soluble in water. This, my dear students, is nitrogen one oxide. Whenever you see this, fairly soluble in cold water, that is nitrogen one oxide. So nitrogen one oxide has the property of being insoluble in warm water, but fairly soluble in cold water. So it dissolves more when the water is colder than warm. And this is the reason why. When you're collecting this gas, you do it using warm water to prevent it dissolving in the water. Now, in case you're wondering, okay, so nitrogen one oxide can actually relight a glowing split? Uh-uh, it can't. So what happens is that if you were to take a glowing split, place it in a jar containing nitrogen one oxide, yes, it will relight, but not because of this gas, because the heat coming from the glowing split is enough to cause nitrogen one oxide to dissociate okay to break apart leading to the formation of nitrogen and oxygen gas and it's the oxygen gas formed that relights the glowing split
By the way, I have a video discussing nitrogen 2 oxide, how to prepare it in the lab, its physical and chemical properties. So if you feel like you'd be interested, check it out. Moving on to Roman 3, has a density of 1.18 gram per cubic centimeters, an oily liquid changes blue hydrated copper 2 sulfate to white. Okay, this is concentrated sulfuric 6 acid. This is the exact density of conch sulfuric 6 acid. And yes, it has an oily feel to it. And it's capable of changing blue hydrated copper 2 sulfate white. Why, you may ask? Okay, let's explain. So hydrated copper 2 sulfate is blue in color due to the presence of water molecules within its crystal structure. Now concentrated sulfuric 6 acid has a very strong affinity for water. And that is the reason why it's a strong dehydrating agent. So it's capable of removing water molecules from substances. So when conch sulfuric 6 acid comes into contact with hydrated copper 2 sulfate, what happens? It removes the water molecules from the copper 2 sulfate crystals. The removal of the water results in the formation of anhydrous copper 2 sulfate, which is white in color. And there you go. Question number six, define the term fermentation. This is the process in which organic materials are decomposed by microorganisms with the production of ethanol, carbon-4 oxide, and heat. Part B, name the compounds formed when potassium metal reacts with ethanol, potassium ethoxide. With ethanoic acid, you get a salt that is referred to as potassium ethanoid. Question number seven, a hydrated salt of copper has the formula, okay, copper 2 sulfate, and that is the water of crystallization. About 25 grams of the salt was heated until all the water evaporated. If the mass of the anhydrous salt is 16 grams, find the value of N. Okay, so the whole of it, Copper 2 sulfate, including the water of crystallization, had a mass of 25 grams. But on heating, of course, the water will evaporate. And whatever you're going to be left with is just copper 2 sulfate. This is 16 grams. So the difference in mass is what was lost through evaporation. Therefore, the mass of water is 9 grams, 25 minus 16. So once we're done with that, our next step is determining the molar mass. So how do we determine the molar mass of copper 2 sulfate and water? Simple, by taking the relative atomic masses of the individual elements and summing them. So in the case of copper 2 sulfate, the RAM of copper is 64, that of sulfur is 32, oxygen is 16, but we have 4. The sum of this gives us 160. When it comes to water, the RMM is 18, 2 from hydrogen, 16 from oxygen. Next step, determining the number of moles. How are we going to find the number of moles? By taking the mass, dividing it by the molar mass. 16 by 160 gives us 0 0.1. In the case of water, we have 0 0.5. So we had 0 0.1 moles of copper 2 sulfate and 0 0.5 moles of water in the 25 grams of the salt. Last step, mole ratio. Between these two, which is the smaller value? 0 0.1. So we are going to divide these two by 0 0.1. In the case of copper, we get 1. In the case of water, we get 5. So that means we have 5 moles of water of crystallization. On to the next question. When 100 cubic centimeters of 0 0.5 molar sulfuric acid solution reacts with 100 cubic centimeters of 1 molar sodium hydroxide solution, the temperature rises by 6.85 Kelvin. Okay, so that is the density, 1 gram per cubic centimeters. Specific heat capacity is 4.2 kilojoules per kilograms per Kelvin. Now, I want to say this. When you're given the specific heat capacity, be very, very keen. Check out the unit because in some cases, you could find that this could actually be in grams. So if it's in grams and the mass that you've been provided with is also in grams, you're just going to leave it the way it is. But if it's in kilogram, like in this case, we will need to convert our mass to kgs. And how do you do that? By dividing by 1,000. Now, 
Calculate the molar heat of neutralization described by the equation. Okay, so we're having an equation, sulfuric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide to form sodium sulfate plus water. This is a neutralization reaction. So we are going to use this to determine the mole ratio. So our mole ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 1 is to 2. Okay. Now, step number one, finding the enthalpy. Okay, the enthalpy of neutralization for this particular reaction. How do we do so? By using the formula. So mass multiplied by the specific heat capacity by the change in temperature. Change in temperature, we've already been provided, 6.85. The temperature rose by 6.85. That is already the change. Specific heat capacity is that. Now on to the mass. How are we determining the mass? Simple. By taking the volume multiplied by the density. We have been told that density is 1 gram per cubic centimeters. What about the volume? If we have 100 cubic centimeters of sulfuric acid being neutralized by 100 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide, the resulting volume of the solution is going to be 200 cubic centimeters. So 200 by 1 will give us 200 grams. So 200 grams, we are then going to divide it by 1,000 to convert it to kilograms. Then multiply it by 4.2 and 6.85. And this gives us the enthalpy as 5.754. Now, one thing, this is going to have a negative sign. Why? Because this process is clearly exothermic. Exothermic processes are those which lead to the evolution of heat. You're going to have heat energy being produced. How do I know that heat energy was produced? Because the temperature rose. So this reaction produces heat and this heat causes the temperature to increase. So we're going to place a negative sign over here to show that this process was exothermic. Are we done? Almost. There's just one small step remaining. Now the question is asking for the molar heat of neutralization. What we got is the heat of neutralization for this particular reaction. The question wants to know if one mole of water is produced through neutralization, how much heat energy will be evolved? So we need to find out the moles of water that were produced in this particular reaction. Why am I talking about the moles of water? Because this is neutralization, okay? So what are the moles of sodium hydroxide? Okay, we can calculate this easily by taking the molarity multiplied by volume over 1000. The molarity is 1, the volume is 100 divided by 1000, gives us the number of moles as 0 0.1. Now, if you look at the equation, there were 2 moles of sodium hydroxide being used up and 2 moles of water being produced. So the number of moles of sodium hydroxide should be equivalent to the number of moles of water. So if we have 0 0.1 moles of sodium hydroxide, then definitely 0 0.1 moles of water were produced. So if 0 0.1 moles of water led to the production of 5.754 kilojoules of energy, what about one mole? So we cross multiply and we end up having the answer as 57.54 kilojoules per mole. Don't forget the negative sign, of course. Question number nine, name the catalyst used in the following processes esterification so esterification is the process whereby you're going to have an alkanol reacting with an alkanoic acid leading to the production of an ester and water the catalyst used is concentrated sulfuric six acid roman 2 ostwald process this is the process that is involved in industrial manufacture of nitric five acid the catalyst used is platinum rhodium catalyst and lastly, preparation of hydrogen in the lab. Now, during laboratory preparation of hydrogen using zinc and hydrochloric acid, a small amount of copper 2 sulfate can also be added to speed up the reaction. So this is the catalyst. Question 10a, state Gay-Lussac's law. So when gases react, they do so in volumes that bear simple whole number ratios to each other and to the products if gaseous. Part B. 
15 cubic centimeters of ethene while mixed with 50 cubic centimeters of oxygen and the mixture was packed to complete the reaction. If all volumes were measured at a pressure of one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius, calculate the volume of the resulting gaseous mixture. Okay, what is the question telling us? We are reacting ethene with oxygen. So when you're told that the mixture was packed, you know, it was simply ignited. So we are talking about combustion of ethene. That is the formula of ethene. As you can see, this is a hydrocarbon. So when hydrocarbons burn in oxygen, they lead to the production of only two products, carbon four oxide and water. So if we balance this equation, we have the following mole ratio. One mole of ethene reacts with three moles of oxygen leading to the production of two moles of carbon four oxide and two moles of water. So the question wants to know what will be the volume of the gases that will be left after the reaction is complete. Now, in these two, we have these two reagents, ethene and oxygen, which is the limiting reagent here, it's ethene. So the limiting reagent is simply the one that will be completely used up. So if one mole is equivalent to 15 cubic centimeters, three moles will be 45 cubic centimeters. So 45 cubic centimeters of oxygen are required for this particular reaction. What did we have? What was the volume of oxygen that we had? 50 cubic centimeters. So we are going to have an excess of five cubic centimeters. This will be left unreacted. It's going to remain at the end, you know? Now, what about the volume of carbon four oxide produced? It's going to be 30 cubic centimeters. Again, if 15 is one, two will be 30. What about water? Same thing, 30 cubic centimeters. So the volume of the resulting mixture is going to contain carbon four oxide, the water vapor, and the excess unused oxygen gas. So 30 plus 30 plus five cubic centimeters, giving us a total of 65 cubic centimeters. Moving on to the next question. The setup below was used to prepare nitric 5 acid. Okay, so over here we have sodium nitrate. Roman 1, give the name of liquid R. Now, preparation of nitric 5 acid can take place by the reaction of concentrated sulfuric 6 acid and a suitable nitrate. In this case, the nitrate being used is sodium nitrate. Now, in most cases, the nitrates of sodium and uh, potassium are the ones that are usually preferred because they form soluble sulfates. Remember, all salts of potassium and sodium are soluble. So in this case, we're using sodium nitrate. So sodium nitrate will react with conch sulfuric 6 acid to form sodium hydrogen sulfate and nitric acid. Now, in case you're wondering, okay, why are we forming sodium hydrogen sulfate and not sodium sulfate? I have an answer for you. So for this process, the acidic salt of sodium hydrogen sulfate is formed instead of the normal salt of sodium sulfate. Pause. What is an acidic salt? These are salts that contain a replaceable hydrogen atom. Salts like sodium hydrogen carbonate, sodium hydrogen sulfate, potassium hydrogen phosphate, those, okay? So those contain a replaceable hydrogen atom and therefore are referred to as acidic salts. The salts that don't contain a replaceable hydrogen atoms are referred to as normal salts, which will come at sodium carbonate, potassium sulfate, those. So in this reaction, you get the acidic salt because getting the normal salt requires extremely high temperatures that cannot be safely achieved in a standard school lab. Now, Roman 3, set the role of tap water. It condenses the nitric 5 acid fumes to liquid so that it can be collected. Moving on to the next question, study the information given in the table below and answer the questions that follow. Okay, so calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction below. What reaction do we have here? We have methane reacting with bromine to form bromomethane and hydrogen bromide. Now, before we talk about uh, the enthalpy change, I want to say something. When it comes to atoms, 
in uh, elements, molecules, or compounds, these are going to be held together by bonds, chemical bonds. So for them to react, you need to break apart these bonds, and for that, you need energy. So you need energy which is going to be absorbed and which will then be used to break apart these bonds so that the atoms can be free to react and form new bonds. So for example here, you need energy to break apart the covalent bonds holding the methane molecules and also break apart the bonds holding the bromine atoms together in the molecule. So energy is needed. So you're going to have energy being absorbed. Okay, so breaking of bonds is an endothermic process because it involves absorption of heat energy. Now, once these bonds have been broken up, the atoms are now free and they can rearrange themselves and form new bonds and therefore form new products. Now, formation of new bonds leads to the production of energy and therefore this process is exothermic. Now, if you want to calculate the enthalpy change for this reaction, we're going to use the following formula bond breaking energy plus bond formation energy so we need to calculate so starting on this side of the equation let's look at the methane molecule how many bonds of carbon to hydrogen do we have we have four and each requires the energy of 413 so 413 multiplied by four what about for the bromine molecule we need 193 so we are going to sum them up and get that don't forget the sign Remember, bond breaking is positive because this is endothermic. Now, moving on to the right side of the equation, we can see that in the bromomethane molecule, we have three carbon to hydrogen bonds and one carbon to bromine bond. Okay, so a total of that. Moving on to HBr, HBr is 365. Sum these up, assign the negative sign because this process is exothermic. Now, what are we going to do? Simple. Sum this. Sum the total energy for either side of the equation. And this gives us negative 39 kilojoules. So, since the overall energy is negative, that means the formation of the above products is exothermic. So, it involves evolution of energy. Question number 13. Differentiate between hydrolysis and saponification. So hydrolysis is the chemical breakdown of a compound into simpler constituents by reacting it with water. Saponification. This is the hydrolysis of fats or oils by an alkali and it involves boiling. Next question. Zeolites, okay, that is a complex compound, clearly a complex compound of sodium. That is used to soften hard water in the ion exchange methods according to the equation below. Okay, so why is water considered to be hard? Because it has salts of either calcium or magnesium. So in this case, let's assume they are those of calcium. So calcium ions are going to react with the zeolite. This is a complex compound of sodium. All you need to do is, you know, to know that it contains sodium. So if we have sodium over here and we have calcium ions over there, what will happen? You're going to have double displacement. The cations are going to switch. So calcium ions are then going to combine with the complex ion, okay? X. Sodium ions are going to combine with whatever calcium ion had been bonded to. It could be sulfate, it could be carbonate. And then since all salts of sodium are soluble, it's just going to pass out. So the water that passes out is going to be salt. Calcium forming an insoluble salt is going to remain in the exchanger. Now, after some time, of course, the zeolite gets exhausted and ceases to soften water. You know, it doesn't do a good job anymore. Why? Because these, these have been replaced with those. So you need to regenerate it. You know, you need to boost it up. You need to provide an input of sodium ions. How? By passing any solution of sodium. So in this case, we are passing sodium chloride solution. So this is going to be regenerated. Name two other methods used in softening hard water. Boiling, addition of sodium carbonate or ammonia. On to question 15. The table below gives information about some reactions of metals 
A, B, C, and D, and there it is. Okay. So we are having the four metals reacting with acids and then reacting with water and also re action of heat on its nitrate. Okay. So we are taking the nitrates of each of these metals, heating them to see the products that are being formed. Okay. Now let's start with the acid. Now, when it comes to acids, only metals that are more reactive than hydrogen in the reactivity series will react with the acid. Why? Because all acids, number one, have hydrogen. And for the metal to react with the acid, it needs to be more reactive so that it can displace the hydrogen. You know, ibandue ile hydrogen and it take over the place. Now, if you have a metal that is less reactive than hydrogen, it's not going to be able to react with the acid. Do we have that here? Yes. So A and C are more reactive because they reacted with the acid leading to the production of hydrogen gas. B and D, no. Okay, so we already know A and C are more reactive than B and D. Now continuing to the next, reaction with water. So the only one that reacts with water is C. So that means that out of these four, C is the most reactive. So we know it's C, then A. Now, onto the last two, B and D, which is more reactive than the other. So let's look at action of heat on its nitrate. When it comes to nitrates, and when nitrates are heated, they will all decompose. But the more a nitrate decomposes, the less reactive it is. Okay, look at this. What are you noticing? That as you're going down, what happens is that the metals are decreasing in reactivity, right? But look at the decomposition. They are breaking down more. So, for example, silver is the least reactive. But when it comes to decomposition, it decomposes the best by forming a metal. Okay? So, in this case, if we have B and D and B forms the metal, that means B is the one that is less reactive than D. Question number 16. Elements X, Y, and Z have atomic numbers 9, 11, and 18, respectively. Which element can be used in electric light bulbs? This is neon. So let's look at the atomic numbers. X has the atomic number of 9, so it also has 9 electrons. If we arrange this in their energy levels, we get an electron configuration of 2, 7. Y, 2, 8, 1. Z, 2, 8, 8. So Z is our answer. B, which two elements react to form an ionic compound? Okay, that is definitely not going to be Z. So what are we remaining with? X and Y. What is X, by the way? That is fluorine and Y is sodium. Okay. C, write an equation for the reaction between element Y and water. So the reaction between sodium and water. So we are going to start with Y. Y reacting with water. The hydroxide that is going to be formed is going to have this formula. Why? <laughs> no, as in uh, why the question, okay? Why has one valence electron? Hydroxide has one. So you get this formula plus hydrogen gas. Now we need to balance this. Why? Because over here we have three hydrogen atoms and on the other side only two. So we'll place two over there, two over there, and there too. And our equation is balanced. Question number 17a. What is a universal indicator? This is a mixture of several dyes that shows different colors depending on the strength of acids and bases. Part B, set one advantage of universal indicator over other commercial indicators. Now, universal indicator is better because not only does it tell you which is an acid and which is a base, it also informs you of the strength of the acid and bases. Like, is this a strong acid or is it a weak one and such? On to the next question. A heavy metal P was dissolved in dilute nitric acid to form a solution of compound. Okay, that. So it forms a nitrate. And clearly, P has a valency of 2. So portions of the resulting solution were treated as follows. Part A. To the first portion, a solution of dilute hydrochloric acid is added where a white precipitate S is formed. Okay, so let's look at that. Whatever chloride of P is formed is going to be 
an insoluble one. So coming back to our knowledge of salts, all chlorides are soluble except for silver and lead to chloride. Okay, so could it be lead? Let's see. The second portion is treated with two drops of two molar sodium hydroxide solution where a white precipitate T is formed. The white precipitate dissolved in excess sodium hydroxide to form a colorless solution. Okay, so you're telling me that this solution of P on addition of a few drops of sodium hydroxide formed a white precipitate, but on addition of excess, it dissolves to form a colorless solution. Guys, don't we know what this is? Remember Zal? When it comes to dissolving in excess sodium hydroxide to form a colorless solution, we only have three possibilities. It could either be a solution of zinc, aluminum, or lead. Now, zinc chloride and aluminum chloride are soluble. So I definitely know that this is lead. So the heavy metal P was lead. Now moving on to C. A solution of potassium iodide is added to the third portion where a yellow precipitate U is formed. Ah, the yellow precipitate is definitely lead to iodide. Part D, when the resulting solution is evaporated to dryness and heated strongly, a yellow solid is formed and a brown gas, and a colorless gas, okay. So what they're saying is, when they took lead to nitrate and heated it, it decomposed, leading to the following three products. A yellow solid, that will definitely be lead to oxide. A brown gas, ha, huh, nitrogen four oxide. A colorless gas, that, my dear students, is oxygen. So if we were to identify the following substances, P is going to be the lead metal. S is going to be lead to chloride. T is going to be lead to hydroxide, U lead to iodide, V lead to oxide, and W nitrogen for oxide. Next question. Sodium thiosulfate was reacted with dilute hydrochloric acid in a round bottom flask as shown below. The gas evolved was collected by downward delivery in a gas jar. Okay. So, we have sodium thiosulfate reacting with dilute hydrochloric acid. Now, if these two were to react together, they will lead to the formation of the following four products. Sodium chloride, sulfur, which is going to be a yellow precipitate, sulfur four oxide, and water. Now, the gas that is being collected is sulfur four oxide. Part B, state the observation noted on the filter paper. Give a reason for your answer, okay? So we have a moist filter paper soaked in acidified potassium chromium 6 solution. Okay, so the filter paper initially is going to be orange in color due to the presence of that solution. But when it comes into contact with sulfur 4 oxide, it's going to turn from orange to green. Now let me explain this. That setup is used for the collection of sulfur 4 oxide. Okay, that is downward delivery. This is used for the collection of gases that are denser than air. Sulfur 4 oxide is. So what happens is that being denser than air, it's going to settle at the bottom, displace air upwards. So it's going to continue filling in the jar. When it reaches the very brim of the jar, you know, the top, it's going to cause a change in the filter paper. So by doing so, you're going to become aware that the gas jar is now full of sulfur 4 oxide. Now the reason there is this change is because sulfur 4 oxide is a strong reducing agent okay so essentially what happens is that it reduces the chromium 6 ions to chromium 3 ions okay let's pause there you see that those are going to have chromium 6 ions what is the 6 for that is the oxidation number of the chromium ions now what happens is that when it comes into contact with sulfur 4 oxide it is reduced to chromium-3 ions, as you can see. Reduction is a decrease in the oxidation number. You have the oxidation number decreasing from plus 6 to plus 3. That is reduction. So the chromium ions are undergoing reduction because of the sulfur-4 oxide. Therefore, bringing about a change from orange to green because chromium-3 ions are green in color. Next question, state one use of each of the following apparatus in the lab. Conical flask, measuring approximate volumes, desiccator, keeping substances free from moisture, crucible, 
heating solids that require very strong heating. Number 22, define vulcanization. This is the process of hardening rubber by heating it with sulfur. Roman 2, what is the importance of the above defined process? It improves the quality of rubber. It makes the rubber tougher, you know, less flexible. Question number 23. Two gas jars containing hydrogen chloride gas and ammonia were close to each other as shown below. State and explain the observations made. Okay. So hydrogen chloride will react with ammonia to form ammonium chloride. Now this is going to be seen as white dense fumes. Roman number two, state the significance of the above experiment, okay? Is the formation of ammonium chloride of a particular importance to chemistry? Yes, because this is the reaction that is used to test for the presence of hydrogen chloride gas. Next question, unknown substances had pH values as shown in the table below. Substance A, pH value of 6, okay, weakly acidic. Substance B, 2, strongly acidic. C, 8, hmm, weakly basic. State which substance is likely to be lemon juice. That is A, of course. Roman 2, identify a substance that would be a better electrolyte. Explain. Okay. So when it comes to electrolytes, these are substances that have mobile ions which can conduct electricity. Now, strong acids and strong bases are better electrolytes. Since we don't have a strong base here, we do have a strong acid, then B will be the better electrolyte. Now, the reason is because when it comes to strong acids, they dissociate completely in water to form hydrogen ions, okay? A weak acid, on the other hand, like the lemon juice, is going to partially dissociate. You know, part, some of the molecules will dissociate, others will not. So at the end, you're going to have a lower concentration of hydrogen ions. And since it's the ions that are responsible for conducting electricity, that makes them weak electrolytes. So the more ions present, the better, because conductivity of electrolytes is dependent on the amount of ions present. So B. Question number 25. The scheme below shows some reaction sequence starting with solid M. Okay, we look at what is happening. We have M reacting with sulfuric acid to form a solution in hydrogen gas. Okay, and then on addition of a few drops of aqueous ammonia, a precipitate is formed. On addition of excess, the precipitate dissolves. Ah. This is definitely a compound of zinc. So M, yeah, M is zinc metal. Why? Because zinc metal reacts with hydrogen sulfuric acid, sorry, to form zinc sulfate plus hydrogen gas. Remember metal and an acid, you get salt and hydrogen gas. Now, the reason why I'm so sure this is zinc is because when it comes to hydroxides of metals, it's only the hydroxides of zinc and copper that dissolve in excess ammonia to form soluble complex ions. Now, because it's definitely not copper because it's not blue, it's colorless, this is definitely the hydroxide of zinc. Now, zinc dissolves to form a complex soluble ion. So what is the name of this complex ion? Tetraamine zinc 2 ion. Okay, let me break it down for you. Tetra means 4, right? Amine refers to the ammonia molecules. So tetraamine, we have 4 ammonia molecules. What about zinc? The zinc ion has a charge of 2 plus. So this 2 plus indicates that the oxidation state of zinc is 2 plus. So the name tells us that there are four ammonia molecules coordinated to a zinc ion that has a charge of 2. Moving on to the next question. Write an ionic equation for the reaction between lead 2 nitrate and solution N. Now this is lead 2 nitrate and solution N, which is going to be zinc uh, sulfate. So in this case, we're going to have double displacement taking place. So double displacement is a type of reaction whereby you're going to have uh, cations of two compounds switching places. So as you can see, zinc switches places with the lead two ions, leading to the formation of lead two sulfate and zinc nitrate. Now, the question is asking us for the ionic equation. 
So our ionic equation is going to be as such. Lead 2 ions reacting with sulfate ions to form insoluble lead 2 sulfate. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of this amazing revision. See you next time.